Welcome all of you here to a lunchtime seminar about reflux disease. Those of you who are having the chicken sandwich will know better what I'm talking about than those of you having the salad. Can everybody hear me okay? I can project as much as I need to, believe me, but hopefully uh, you'll be able to hear me just fine. Um, this is a wonderful facility for us to be able to get together and, and speak. And this, is, uh, this presentation is something I like to do uh, in a community setting. And uh, as I tell patients, what I hope they're going to get from this is the equivalent or attendees is the equivalent of sort of like almost a one hour consultation of what we might do in the office to discuss gastroesophageal reflux disease. We're, uh, you may be aware that the uh, Northeast Georgia Health System has a lot of accolades. One of those is that we're ranked the number one hospital in GI, gastrointestinal care, and gastrointestinal surgery in Georgia. I'd like to think that some of the things I'm going to talk to you about today are part of the reason why we have that honor. We're very proud of, uh, of the care we're be able, we are able to give patients relative to gastroesophageal reflux disease. I trained at Emory Medical School. I went to med school at Emory Medical School. I trained at Parkland Hospital in Dallas. I've been in practice for over 25 years and done some instructing for a number of uh, national organizations uh, related to surgery and serve as a clinical professor for uh, the Georgia Regents University System. The person who's not with me today is Jessica Keller. She's my physician's assistant certified and works with me as a right-hand individual. She's in the operating room with me. Uh, wonderful uh, clinician as well. She frequently takes care of patients, uh, sees patients on her own and assists me in the operating room. And uh, she's, she's unable to be here today but frequently is working with me in the office and in the operating room. So I don't know how well you can see this from the back. The doctor uh, says it's just a touch of heartburn. So a lot of times patients feel like their symptoms have been minimized over time, but if you're here today, you found your people. You know, we all understand that reflux disease is a significant problem and it really affects the quality of life. Come on in, ladies. So it really, really affects the quality of life and, and uh, we take this problem seriously, not the least of which reasons is that we know that heartburn leads to esophageal cancer. We're going to get around to that in a little bit. Uh, this says tonight's objectives because this is frequently a nighttime presentation, but what I'm going to do is teach you about gastroesophageal reflux disease and some of the non-surgical management techniques that there are. In other words, not everything, you know, the, the answer to everything is not an operation, even for me. So we're going to teach you about that. We're going to review some of the surgical options for gastroesophageal reflux disease. Do you need to come across? What's that? Oh, yes, absolutely. Amanda, do we need some more chairs back there? Thanks. That's a good problem to have. We don't have enough chairs. You saw it was the two of us? <laughs> we'll just pretend it's the two of us. I'm talking to you. We're also going to introduce some of the newest treatment options for gastroesophageal reflux disease, things besides medications and traditional surgery. So what is reflux disease? By definition, this is the backward flow of stomach contents back up into the esophagus. And most people know about acid because that's what all the commercials talk about, Nexium and the like is, is acid reflux. But in fact, there are a lot of things in the stomach besides acid. There is stomach acid, but there are digestive enzymes that come back in there from the pancreas and from the stomach itself, bile salts and the alkaline juice from the pancreas. So even in a patient that doesn't make any acid, because of medication or disease or prior surgery or whatever, there still can be significant reflux problems. It's a real common issue. In this survey of American uh, citizens, 40% of them had reflux at least once a month. And when it got right down to it, about 1% of the patients who were, even those who were on medication, did not get control of their symptoms. And there's an important reason why medication isn't going to help everyone. But the point is, this is a very common disease process, and that's why we have over 40 people in the room today. So how do we know if somebody has gastroesophageal reflux disease, or do they just have heartburn? We classify the disease state as somebody who is having relatively common symptoms. This is arbitrary, maybe three times a week is enough, but certainly if you're having to take medications on a regular basis, you're treating something more than just heartburn. 
and if you've developed complications, regardless of how frequently you're having symptoms, then you have a disease state. By complications, I mean people can develop strictures and other problems, erosive esophagitis, cancer, all those things, that's a disease state. And it's frequently, uh, we know that reflux disease is not something that people tend to have one week and it's gone forever. It tends to be something that gradually uh, comes on and then it stays with you and it requires chronic treatment. It's a very common disease. If your family practitioner uh, sees esophageal problems in their practice, 75% of them are going to be reflux. That's mostly what your primary care doctor sees. It can present with a number of different symptoms. Heartburn is just one of them, and it's usually something that has to be managed lifelong unless there is some dramatic change in, in uh, someone's lifestyle or eating habits. So remember, heartburn is just one of the symptoms that comes from gastroesophageal reflux disease. It does happen to be the most prominent one, but as you can see from this list, there are a number of others. These are the typical symptoms of reflux, heartburn and regurgitation. Difficulty swallowing is a fairly common symptom. It, doesn't happen to, it, it happens to be one that gets our attention because there are certain problems, uh, severe problems that can present that way. But look at this other list over here, the atypical symptoms. These are all things that we see commonly in reflux patients. There's nausea, chest pain, asthma, cough, pneumonia, hoarseness, throat pain, ear pain, mouth sores, and bloating and flatulence. All of those things appear in patients with reflux disease. This graph shows that the most common ones were heartburn and regurgitation, difficulty swallowing, respiratory problems like the asthma and the recurrent pneumonia that I mentioned, and then, uh, and then other lesser common symptoms. But the point of this is that a lot of people know about heartburn. What they don't know is that recurrent pneumonia or asthma could be related to the reflux. They don't quite understand how that could be. There are certain symptoms that when we hear about them, we really want to investigate that patient. We don't want them to just take medicine and go away. When somebody has difficulty swallowing or has painful swallowing, unexplained weight loss, certainly if they're vomiting blood or they get full in a hurry and they're losing weight, those are things that could indicate a more severe problem and they need to be, they need to be investigated thoroughly. This was a picture, it's a little too far away for most people to appreciate, but it was to show what people reported in the way of chest pain when they presented to the emergency room and they didn't have a heart problem. They frequently had pain patterns that looked just like a heart attack. And one of the, one of the most common causes for patients having chest pain that isn't a heart attack, it's reflux disease. In fact, 60% of the patients that went to a particular emergency room and got tested and had no heart trouble but had chest pain, they had reflux as the cause. Let's talk a little bit about the anatomy of what is reflux disease. The esophagus is a muscular tube that comes down the center of the chest and after it passes through the diaphragms, it meets the stomach. And where it meets the stomach, see if I can figure out which is the laser. You won't be able to see it, maybe you will. That's the lower esophageal sphincter. That's right here where the esophagus meets the stomach. And it's not a sphincter like the anal sphincter muscle is. It's not that tight, but it does function in a similar fashion. It should stay closed most of the time and what's in the stomach should be kept in the stomach. The problems occur when that lower esophageal sphincter doesn't work correctly. But the esophagus is a muscular tube. When you swallow your salad or your chicken sandwich, it is pushed into your stomach. It doesn't go there by gravity. You should be able to stand on your head and that swallow will still go into your stomach even if it has to go upside down. So knowing how the esophagus functions and that lower esophageal sphincter function are important parts of understanding reflux disease. But there are other things that can influence reflux like the stomach not emptying well, obesity that pushes on the stomach, tight clothing, lots of different things. But it all stems from does that lower esophageal sphincter, is it able to stand up against the pressure in the stomach and stop regurgitation? It's all about that lower esophageal sphincter. There are lots of things that influence it, but it all comes back to that lower esophageal sphincter. And that sphincter is helped by the shape of the normal stomach presenting a little bit like a flap. And a lot of people will say, well, that, that my doctor told me that flap valve down there was, was not right. And this is really what they're talking about, is that a normal stomach has an angle there, whereas an abnormal stomach begins to look a little bit like a wine bottle. There's no angle there, and there's no, uh, there's no force to help close that lower esophageal sphincter. This is one of the reasons why patients with a hiatal hernia, as I'll show you in a few moments, are more likely to have reflux disease because their stomach takes on an abnormal shape 
and the sphincter no longer works the way it is supposed to. Some of the complications of reflux disease are significant. They include things like esophageal cancer. Most esophageal cancer arises from something called Barrett's esophagus. Barrett's esophagus is a change that occurs in the lining of the esophagus after it gets exposed to reflux too long. This tissue uh, appears in the esophagus. It's more resistant to acid, but it's much more susceptible to esophageal cancer, and it's the number one cause of esophageal cancer in the country today. But what's much more common than that are things like aspiration events, where a patient lies down at night, they regurgitate the evening meal, and they aspirate it because they're, they're you know, very much asleep. And you can see recurrent pneumonias, asthma, other lung problems. Scarring or stricturing in the esophagus can make it difficult to swallow, and there can be bleeding and ulcers in the esophagus as well. Now we have a number of different tools we can use to investigate reflux disease, and I'll go through those just briefly. An upper GI is an x-ray. We drink contrast, take a picture of the, uh, of the contrast going down the esophagus. An EGD, or upper endoscopy, is inserting a flexible scope in the esophagus. And then we have something called a pH probe, which is a test that actually measures how much acid is in the esophagus. So as you can imagine, each one of these tells us a little bit, something a little bit different about your reflux disease. The upper GI or esophagram or barium swallow is very good for showing the anatomy of the stomach and hiatal hernias, and it may even show us when a normal swallow is not present. Or in other words, if you swallow and your esophagus doesn't work well, that's pretty easy to see if what you're swallowing is, is uh, radio-opaque material or contrast. What it is not a tool for is to tell us whether you do or do not have reflux. More importantly, it's not a tool to tell us you don't have reflux. Let me clarify that. If you have a barium swallow done and it shows that you regurgitate a lot, that's helpful because you probably do have reflux. But if you have a barium swallow or an upper GI and they don't see you refluxing, that doesn't matter. That's not very predictive. It doesn't mean a thing because it's a five or ten minute test and that's not a circumstance under which you would have reflux. So we can't use this test to tell you, you're okay, you don't have reflux, don't worry about it. This is a barium swallow picture, and what you see in white is the contrast. So the esophagus is filled in white. That narrowed area there is called a stricture. That's a narrow scar that makes it hard to swallow. In fact, you see this bulb of, t of contrast here? That's the diaphragm. That's part of the stomach above the diaphragm. That's what a small to moderate hiatal hernia looks like on a barium swallow. The nice thing about this is it's a picture I can put up and look at with a patient and we can look at it repeatedly and, and we can see what the anatomy looks like. So that's a good thing for finding strictures and hiatal hernias and things like that. Upper endoscopy, has everybody here had their colonoscopy? I won't make you raise your hands. But if you haven't had your colonoscopy, I don't see anybody in the room except maybe the young lady at the back table who doesn't deserve one. All right? By the time you're 50, <laughs> you're supposed to have had your colonoscopy. So get your colonoscopy. Upper endoscopy is the same concept, a long flexible scope uh, that is inserted through the mouth into the stomach. We look at the tissues. We can do biopsies, take pictures. It's a very good uh, instrument for being able to, uh, to define what sort of problems we have. Can I turn these lights off? Does this switch up here do that? Oh, there we go. So the picture on the right shows a rough looking esophagus, sort of like raw lean hamburger, and the one on the left here looks you know, nice and pink. So we can see whether there are abnormalities in the esophagus, and we can do biopsies and the like. I'm not going to show this video. Uh, it projects very nicely in a big room. It's a picture that I like to show. Uh, a patient gave me permission to use it. We scoped her because of difficulty uh, swallowing, and she had some very bad problems at the, at the lower end of it. But it's a good example of why endoscopy is such a good uh, tool to be able to look in the esophagus. So if I could do one test, one test on somebody that has reflux disease, it's an upper endoscopy. The reason is, that's going to let me find Barrett's esophagus. This is the most serious complication of reflux disease because it leads to cancer. It's a change in the tissue, as I said, caused by exposure to gastric contents, not just acid. So getting rid of the acid isn't good enough. It's all the other stuff that burbles up into the esophagus that can cause these changes. And about, it occurs in about 15 to 20% of the patients who have reflux disease that we scope. 
and the risk factors are how long have you had it and how bad is your reflux. So if you have bad reflux and you've had it a long time, you're much more likely to have Barrett's. You're also more likely to have it if you're an older white male. I see a few of us in the room. So that's uh, one of the risk factors for this as well. And likewise, it's the same group of patients who are at risk of developing esophageal cancer. It's identified with biopsies. If someone looks in your esophagus and says, you don't have Barrett's, that's not good enough. They really need to be doing biopsies if you are being scoped because you have reflux disease. And that's a hard thing, to, a message to get out to the people who are doing the endoscopy, but you have to have the biopsies to really be sure. We know this is the cause of esophageal cancer. The good news, it's treatable. It's treatable by scalding it out with radiofrequency waves. It's, treating, it's treatable by using surgery to prevent progression of the Barrett's. Unfortunately, medicine does not halt the progression of Barrett's. Why doesn't it halt the progression? Because it doesn't stop the reflux disease. All it does is reduce some of the acid in the stomach. You still tend to regurgitate all of those other good things that are in your, in your stomach. Barrett's esophagus is something that earns a patient regular follow-up. We scope them every three to five years to make sure we're not developing any more abnormalities that might put them at greater risk of cancer. This is a picture of a fellow wearing a pH probe. Now there are several different ways we can measure acid in the esophagus. This is one where there's a small catheter placed in the nostril, it goes down into the esophagus, and the patient wears this home attached to a little recorder on their hip. As you might expect, someone with a little tube hanging out of their nose is not going to behave very normally when they go home, and it only works for 24 hours, so it's not our favorite way of doing this, but it is one of the available tests that we sometimes use. What's even better, if you can see this scale picture here of some fingers holding a little pill-like device, that's a radio transmitter that we can actually implant into the esophagus by passing it through the mouth, and it measures acid. Here's a picture of it. This is an endoscopic picture, and there's that probe attached to the wall of the esophagus. Every time acid gets on that probe, it sends a radio signal to a device worn on the hip, and for 48 hours, I can record everything about the acid in your esophagus and then upload it to a computer and see how bad your reflux is. The little pill passes on its own after five to seven days. It's a very nice test, and it is the gold standard for determining whether or not somebody has reflux disease. That's called a Bravo pH. I'm not going to show the uh, animation here because I don't think it's necessary. But this, from that test, we get a graph. And, there, and even from a distance, you can look at this, and I'll tell you the green areas were where this patient was lying down, the white areas were the daytime, and the squiggly blue line is their acid profile. That horizontal red line of four, that's the danger zone. When they get below four, that's a problem. This patient got below four pretty commonly. Interestingly, at nighttime, they really didn't do that very much. A couple times that second night they did, but most of the reflux occurs in the day. Most of it occurs right after meals. This is very typical of reflux patients. No matter whether they think they have a lot of heartburn at night or not, most of them don't actually reflux a lot at night. And when they do, here's a key point. You notice it's in the very beginning of the night, early in the night. So if you're someone who has nighttime symptoms of reflux, propping yourself up for the first couple of hours is the most important time period. Later in, the e later in the morning, if you slide off your pillows, it's not quite so critical. But this is the detail that we're able to generate out of a study like that and really, really understand what makes someone reflux. And more importantly, this helps us to figure out whether symptoms they're having exactly correlated to an episode of reflux because the patient is pushing little buttons that tell me, okay, right now I had heartburn, right now I had uh, regurgitation here, I had chest pain, and we can tell whether or not the symptoms line up with the, with the actual acid exposure that the patient has, and that's very powerful. There are some other diagnostic tests, and one of them is called esophageal motility. Remember I said the esophagus is something that squeezes actively and transports food? It also wipes out the acid in the esophagus if you have an acid episode and then swallow. It should wipe itself clean. So it's important to understand how well the esophagus works, not only because it influences reflux, but there are other disease processes that can look like reflux to the untrained observer. This is a, this is a pressure uh, test that is translated into color. And, and if you've ever seen the television show, the best analogy I have is the television show Cops. 
they're looking for someone in the dark, they always get out that thermal infrared camera and you see the, the burglar hiding in the bushes because his heat signature. So you can think of this sort of like a heat signature except it's pressure. So red areas are high pressure and every, every person has an upper esophageal sphincter and a lower esophageal sphincter and when we swallow the upper esophageal sphincter relaxes, the food is pushed down the esophagus, the lower esophageal sphincter relaxes and it's pushed into the stomach. So this is a very normal study and no one here is going to be expert in, in reading them but just remember what that looks like and compare that to an abnormal one, that's not normal. This is a patient that has an upper sphincter, a lower sphincter, the lower sphincter never relaxes and there's no good swallow there. So this is an example of a patient with a disease called achalasia. We commonly see patients with achalasia. We treat this as well very effectively, but it frequently has fooled someone into thinking they had reflux disease because in this disease, the lower esophagus sphincter won't relax. The patient swallows, their food just packs up in their chest. They go lie down, it all comes back up, and they think, well, I must have reflux. My food just came back up. No, it never got into the stomach. It was still in the esophagus. This just illustrates the importance of, of being very thorough in evaluating a patient's reflux disease. I've seen lots of patients who have fooled lots of doctors with their achalasia, fooled them into thinking they had reflux disease. So there's that familiar anatomy. Let's go back to, to talk about what some of the treatments then would be for reflux disease. As with any disease state, you don't start with the, the biggest, most powerful thing you have right away because those tend to be the things that have more complications, etc. You start with what's easy and you work your way up. You start with lifestyle changes, the things you can do that are easy, having to do with what you eat and how you eat it. We start then with over-the-counter medications. Most reflux patients hit on these pretty quickly. You might move up to a prescription drug next. There are certain endoscopic treatments for reflux disease. And then finally, surgery may be appropriate in some patients. And there are different surgical procedures that are available. So we'll, we'll go over those in just a moment. How about those lifestyle modifications? The first thing is low-fat meals, small portions. It's all about portion control with reflux disease because when you fill the stomach with food, that lower esophageal sphincter gets pulled open. That's why patients reflux after meals. So frequent smaller meals, avoiding spicy foods, acidic foods, tomato juice or tomatoes, orange juice, caffeine, alcohol, peppermint, chocolate, all the good stuff. Those are the things that are going to give you trouble. Chocolate, <laughs> chocolate yeah, I know, I hate that. Weight reduction. Why weight reduction? Because all the pressure that goes on the stomach is pushing against that gentle little valve and it's very easy to spring it open and make the food go back and the acid go back up in the esophagus. Avoid restrictive clothing. I know at home I've got a certain pair of pants that if I try and wear them or a certain belt I'm going to end up having more trouble than if I wear proper fitting clothing. But reduction of the caffeine and the alcohol uh, consumption as well. Patients who are experiencing nocturnal regurgitation, as I said, may get some relief from elevating the head of the bed. We know that cigarette smoking immediately causes an increase in reflux episodes. There are lots of things in cigarette smoke that are toxic. There are some of those that will immediately relax the lower esophageal sphincter. There are certain medications that are going to make your reflux worse. You probably can't do without them. Things like asthma and, and cardiac medications, beta blockers, for instance. but. Uh, those drugs do influence how that lower esophageal sphincter works. So let's say you've been, through the, you've been through the business of propping up the bed, the pillows, the medication, what comes next? Well, medical therapy, either over-the-counter or prescription uh, drug therapy. And there are, these drugs have been available since the 1970s. They've gradually all made it uh, pretty much to over-the-counter therapy. How do these medications work? Well, Tums, uh, like we've got back there on the table, and liquid antacids and those things work by directly neutralizing what is in your stomach at that moment. Kind of like food does. If we measured the pH in your stomach right now, it's as high as it's going to get because we've neutralized all the acid in there and over a period of hours that acid is going to come back. These antacids work the same way. They neutralize what's in your stomach. The, the pills that you're aware of work by reducing the acidity of what is in the stomach as well. But they do so by turning off the pumps in the stomach wall that produce acid. Now they work in a different way 
And the most important thing I can tell you is that if you're on one of the most potent medications, it's a class called PPIs, omeprazole or Prilosec, uh, esomeprazole or Nexium, pantoprazole or Protonix, Dexalant, I don't even remember what that one's called, Lansoprazole, which is Prevacid, Asifex, those are all a class of drugs that work by destroying acid pumps in the stomach. But what you have to do is take them and then turn the pumps on with a little something to eat so that they can wipe the pumps out. Because then they're going to be gone from your bloodstream in about four to six hours. They're not even going to be there 12 hours later, but they've done their job. They knocked out the pumps and you have to take them every day to keep the pumps under control. That's why when you watch the television commercial, the Zantac commercial always hits on the, the Nexium because or Prilosec because it doesn't work right away. Well, in part, that's true. It doesn't work right away, but it works better if you take it a series of days in a row. It knocks out those acid pumps. If you don't take it, the acid pumps start growing back, about 1 to 2 percent per hour. So by two days, three days, those acid pumps are starting to work pretty well, and that's when most people notice, hey, I forgot to take my medicine the last couple of days. So it's important if you're taking that class of drug, you generally you take it in the morning and then have something to eat. Some people it seems to work better taking it in the af late afternoon and having something to eat. Don't take it at bedtime. That's the wrong time because first off, you don't want to eat and go to bed. And second off, if you're not going to eat, you haven't stimulated your stomach and that medication is not going to work. The older medications like Zantac, Pepsid, that, those are called H2 blockers. Those have been around a lot longer. Those you can take any time. All they do is just turn the pumps off. They don't destroy them. So you can take them any time you want. They're particularly good to take right before bedtime when you don't want to eat something. And they control nighttime heartburn really well. So that's what we usually recommend at bedtime. But they're not generally good enough to control acid reflux for most patients. But the important thing about medications is to understand neither one of them controls regurgitation. You will still regurgitate, you still have reflux. This is important to understand because the major difference between medical therapy for reflux and surgical therapies is what the surgery does is it recreates a valve-like mechanism. Now you no longer regurgitate. Your reflux is gone. It doesn't matter what's in your stomach. Your stomach is designed for acid, so we're not worried that it's there. Therefore, we can take you off your medications. Why does the medication fail? Well, for one thing, as I said, it doesn't actually treat the regurgitation. So if you're somebody who wakes up at night choking on your regurgitant, I'm sorry, that's as good as your medicine is going to do for you. Also, the medications tend to become less effective with time. We build up a resistance. One study looked at this, and after five years of medication, over half of the patients had to double or triple their medication in order to get the same effect. Now, I run into a lot of patients where I have a hard time just getting them the regular dose of medication. The insurance companies are not real tickled about me trying to go much higher than that. It's difficult sometimes for patients to always remember when they take their medication or to take them the way I describe. And frankly, sometimes it doesn't matter how much medicine you take. If you've got a hiatal hernia, some other anatomic abnormality, the medicine simply isn't going to be able to control those same regurgitative symptoms. You can't read this slide. I put this up here as, as a reminder to myself that these medicines have a lot of side effects. It's very easy to find publications that say that these medicines cause osteoporosis. They interfere with your plavix. They keep you from absorbing magnesium and calcium and iron and B12. The fact is these are wonderful medications. They really are a wonder drug of sorts. But you have to understand that shutting off the acid production in your stomach is not a natural state. We have acid there for a reason. It is the first barrier into your stomach. If you eat bad food, that's where the bacteria first have a chance to get killed, in that acid soup in your stomach. If you don't have that there, you're more likely to absorb or to pass some of those things on into your GI tract and develop infections like Shigella, Salmonella, uh, Clostridium difficile, or C. diff. That's a new one that we're having to deal with. So there are side effects of the medicine. It's important as a society, considering how much money we spend on these drugs, uh, it's important for us to understand what their limitations are. In the last survey of drugs in this country, the top two drugs uh, in terms of money spent, the first one was, a, was no, the first one was um, uh, one of the antidepressants. I'm blocking on the name of it. Number two was Nexium, 
12 billion dollars a year spent in the United States on Nexium. 12 billion dollars. It's important as a society that we understand that we're spending our money in the right way to take care of patients and not giving it, uh, you know, without the, getting the benefit. Now, unfortunately, most people think about surgical therapy as something kind of daunting like this, but the fact is that surgery has gotten much easier for both of us, frankly, over the years. This is an example, hopefully not too far for those to see in the back, but let me describe it. Uh, there's probably somebody in the room that has this nice cut up under the ribs we used to call a saber slash. That's how we got the gallbladder out a long time ago. That gradually got a little bit smaller until finally most people now do laparoscopic surgery through four small punctures, but it's even possible to make one puncture at the belly button and take the gallbladder out that way. We've known how to do that for almost 10 years. That was, a, that was a technique we taught for a while. I still use it in the right patients, but the point is that here's someone having their gallbladder out, all four instruments going in through a little hole, and there's the picture on the screen. So we're really working to make surgical therapy less daunting for patients. And a lot of what you hear about surgical therapy, microdiscectomy and minimally invasive this and that, it's all about trying to make surgery less risky, easier to tolerate for the patients. So who's a surgical candidate? Frankly, anybody that no longer has any sort of good symptom control with their medication is a candidate. Those who have developed complications, I have to question whether or not, you know, what's the point of continuing medication when you've developed complications on that medication, especially bleeding and other things that medicine won't handle, or aspiration, which comes from regurgitation that the medicine will never fix. Uh, patients sometimes just get tired of taking medication. They don't like the sense of dependency. Uh, they can't take the medication because of allergies or diarrhea or some other or headaches or some other thing like that, or frankly, they just want a better quality of life. Studies show that patients that have had surgical treatment, when you score them on an objective test, uh, actually have a better quality of life than patients that are on medication. They don't regurgitate, they don't have heartburn. The preoperative test we will do on a patient who is being considered for any kind of surgical therapy, whether it's with a scope or operation, we always get those four tests I talk about with, with occasional exceptions. We always do endoscopy, we always try and do manometry, most of the time we do a pH monitoring, and we most of the time are getting a barium swallow. So sometimes reflux patients feel like they've been put through the ringer. It's to be very precise about our evaluation but by the time I get finished with these things, most of the time I think I know everything I possibly could need to know about someone's esophageal function. This shows how the uh, trocar sites or the puncture sites are placed in a patient who's having a Nissen fundoplication. That's the most common operation that we do. It's, a, uh, it's been around since the 1950s and sch schematically it involves taking a part of the stomach and wrapping it around the lower part of the esophagus where that sphincter is. I like to think of it as sort of a, a, a supportive hug. It's not intended to squeeze the esophagus, it's intended to keep it from pulling open. So it, it, it acts like a supportive collar that keeps the esophagus from pulling open when we eat. That's the most common time for reflux, but it works at all other times as well. There are other variations of this where we don't wrap all the way around. That's, there's one called a toupee fundoplication. We use those in patients who have unusual motility patterns and might not do so well with a full wrap. This is a cartoon example showing we're able to see laparoscopically the esophagus and the stomach. We, get, we pull the stomach around the esophagus, we sew it in place, and we're able to do all of this laparoscopically. Much of the time, we're actually putting a patch on the diaphragm to reinforce it if we've had to repair uh, any degree of hiatal hernia. And this is a real picture uh, from the operating room. This is what we see. Uh, this is actually, uh, you know, when, we, when we're operating, we have some, I think they're about 30 inch monitors in high definition. It's much more effective. It's much better than me trying to put my hands in someone and operate on them. Laparoscopy is a tremendous advance. But here you see a patient's liver is lifted up and there's some sort of a cave there. All that stuff is streaming up in there. That's a big hiatal hernia. This is what it looks like when we first look. After we pull all of this stuff out of there, this is what we see. There's the patient's stomach still stuck up in there. There's the stomach going up into the chest. There's that huge hole in the diaphragm, but after we get all of that dissected free, we're now able to, to close the diaphragm, put stitches in it. There's the nothing but the esophagus. That's the way it's supposed to look coming out of the diaphragm. And then ultimately, we're able to put a patch on there, close the diaphragm up, and wrap the stomach around. It looks kind of like the cartoon does, but there's the, uh, 
the front of the stomach, the back of the stomach, and a few little stitches in there with some seam tape to help reinforce that. So this is what we do laparoscopically to repair a, paras a hiatal hernia and to fix someone's reflux disease. This is the Nissen fundoplication. As I said, been around for 50 years. Used to be done open, now it's pretty much uh, all laparoscopically. It is the gold standard against which all other therapies are currently measured. 90, the, the literature says 95% effective uh, at the time that it's done. I don't have any knowledge of a patient who we've done this on who we didn't fix, and we've done hundreds of patients. It's a very effective procedure. In fact, if, it's, if it has a downfall, it's the fact that it is so effective. It is so effective that occasionally patients don't belch as easily as they'd like, and they may not vomit. They probably aren't going to vomit normally, but it is a very effective operation. Now, people have heartburn and regurgitation every day. Once every year or two, they may feel like they need to vomit, and when that happens, we give these patients nausea medicine to have. But the bottom line is when the alternative is sleeping in a recliner because you're afraid of regurgitating or once in a while having to take nausea medicine, patients are uniformly happy to take nausea medicine when they need it. Typically, any hiatal hernia, even the one that size where most of the stomach was in the chest, it's repaired. This is an overnight stay, usually less than two hours in the operating room, and we send patients home on a soft diet. We don't bother with a liquid diet. It's unnecessary. And my goal, as I tell patients, is I want you to have no heartburn, no regurgitation, eat whatever you want, and not require any medications. And we are very close to getting that in every patient. The keys to success with this, well, I've shown you that it's very important that we do a very rigorous evaluation with diagnostic testing. It's important to intervene earlier in the disease. If we wait till there's complications, we have somewhat less uh, benefit, but there is no patient who I would recommend, who I would tell that we won't operate on your reflux because you're too far gone. That just doesn't happen. There isn't anyone whose reflux we can't fix. It just may be a different operation than what someone thinks. And I can't overemphasize, I don't care what kind of surgery you're having, don't hesitate to ask your doctor, how much of this do you do? How many, and what, what's your experience level? And any surgeon who, who's proud of what they're doing will be happy to share their experience with you. This is something I've been told that we do more of this than Emory does, uh, all, their whole department. So w this is something that we focus on, do an awful lot of, and uh, we're very proud of that and have had excellent, tech, uh, excellent outcomes. Limitations of the fundoplication. I told you that the uh, patients may get gas bloat symptoms if they don't belch very well. They don't tend to vomit normally. Uh, it can fail, but at 10 years, it's 90% effective. And in the last five years, uh, we, we operate on 110 or 120 patients a year doing this, and I have seen one patient that we have reoperated on because of a failure uh, in the past five years. It's not suitable for a morbidly obese patient, and it's, it's actually not even morbidly obese. Uh, obesity is measured by something called the body mass index. It's a combination of how tall are you and how much do you weigh, because it kind of makes sense if you're 180 pounds and five feet tall, that doesn't work, but if you're 180 pounds and six feet four, that's a different equation. So we use that number, the body mass index, to indicate a level of obesity. A body mass index over 35 is undesirable for this kind of surgery. Over 40, it's absolutely a no-no, and we use different techniques to treat that. Primarily what we would do with a patient with an appropriately high body mass index is a bariatric procedure. Now, why a, why a weight loss operation for a patient with reflux? Well, for one thing, the typical weight loss operation is an excellent reflux operation. It's used that way in Europe. Here is normal anatomy. On the left, things flow in that fashion. On the right, the stomach has been partitioned and a piece of intestine brought up. The plumbing has simply been rerouted so that the patient has a small pouch and doesn't absorb as much. These patients naturally are not going to regurgitate material from their stomach because their stomach is now a different compartment. So this works wonderfully. And there are several other bariatric procedures, somewhat less suitable for reflux patients. But the point is that a Nissen fundoplication or even the other things I'll show you are not for everyone. Sometimes we have to tailor the operation more towards something that focuses on weight reduction and acid control. Because keep in mind, I'm, I, I really am ethically obligated to give somebody what I think is the best treatment. Well, the best treatment for a 35-year-old who has diabetes and high blood pressure and an elevated BMI 
is I want to fix their reflux, their diabetes, their high blood pressure, and keep them from a premature death 20 years down the line. That's why we would go with a bariatric procedure in, many, in those particular patients. There are some other procedures out there that if you go online, you'll hear about these. I'm going to speak about these from experience because I've performed them all on patients, and for one reason or another, I may either still do them or not do them. This was one called a streta procedure where radio frequency waves were delivered into the esophagus using tiny prongs around a balloon. This is still available. It sort of went undercover some years back and has re-emerged. I don't consider it a very good procedure. We don't exactly understand why some patients feel better with it. It does not fix the lower esophageal sphincter. And I'm not currently offering this to patients because I just don't have any faith that it's a good treatment. We did a couple dozen patients when it was available earlier. Uh, we didn't harm anyone, but I am aware of patients where this did not turn out well for the patient. So uh, we don't offer that. A TIF procedure is a very ingenious endoscopic procedure. This is still available. Uh, it's offered, uh, it, it's done with a scope down through the mouth. It creates a nice flat valve the way we would like to see it. The weakness of this is, although it's an ingenious mechanical device, it delivers little sutures into the esophagus that turn out just to be too weak to hold up against the normal abdominal pressure. So we had some limited success with this, but given the expense, when someone comes to the, the hospital and they tell me they want their reflux fixed, I want to give them something that I can predict with a high reliability their reflux will be fixed. This was marginal. We've sort of left this on the wayside too. But if you go online, you'll run into that. What I want to show you is one of the newer systems now, which we've begun to use and has longer term data on it. It is now, it's, it's been FDA approved now for about four, four or five years. There are probably 3,000 patients in the, in the world. Let's see how this is going to work. Three or 4,000 patients in the world with this implanted. And uh, this is called the Lynx system. The Lynx system is a, it's a string of magnetic beads, rare earth magnets encased in titanium and linked with tiny wires. So it really does look like a bracelet. In fact, I've got one in my pocket and I'll pass it along. You all just look at it and feel free to pull it apart and you're not going to hurt it. And you'll see, we put this in laparoscopically and we close it around the esophagus using a customized size for each patient. And what this does is uh, when it's formed around the esophagus, it is strong enough to resist that pressure of regurgitation, but it is weak enough that when we swallow, remember that, again, that esophagus squeezing, the esophagus is powerful enough to push food through this into the stomach. So this is a device that is calibrated to allow swallowing uh, in a normal fashion, but also to allow belching and vomiting. Remember the Nissen fundoplication, I said there could be some issues with that. This allows those activities, but there's always a trade-off. So if we're going to be able to allow such easy return of material from the stomach, like vomiting, it's a little bit less effective in controlling acid. But it turns out that it's, it's proving to be very effective uh, in patients. There's a 94% satisfaction rate with this in the two-year follow-up data, and uh, about 87% of patients at, at five years were still off of their medication. So you can see it's a, you'll see it as it comes around, it's magnetic beads joined together. It's placed laparoscopically using the same small punctures. The difference here is that this is a same day surgery. We send patients home the same day. We also don't change their diet because we want these little beads to get therapy and open and close many times a day. We actually tell patients we want them to eat every couple of hours in small volumes. Um, and then, uh, the recovery from this is, is very straightforward. Patients tend to have less side effects from it. Again, if there's a drawback to this, it's that maybe it doesn't quite give the same reliable control of acid that the other, uh, that the Nissen fundoplication would give. I don't think I'm going to show this. Maybe I can. This is a... Uh, this is what a barium swallow looks like. And this is a patient that already has a Lynx device in there, and you're probably too far away to see the little beads do so, but they actually still pull open months later. They're all healed in there, and the patient swallows barium, and the, uh, the little beads open up. They let things come into the stomach, and then they keep it there, and that's exactly the way it's supposed to function. 
This, the reason I like to show this is because you get the, a sense of what I was talking about with that esophageal squeeze and why that's so important. So the Lynx procedure is done laparoscopically. I think I told you all these things. The other, the other point is that if it were necessary, we have absolutely no plans to take this out of someone. It doesn't require any future adjustments. If it had to be removed for some reason, it can be removed pretty simply. And in terms of complications like erosions, where this might erode into the esophagus, that appears to be an exceedingly small risk. Most of the time it happens in the first couple of years, and it's not a catastrophe. We just take the device out, and it seems to be something that's very easily managed, going from a Lynx procedure then on to a Nissen fundoplication and fixing the whole problem. Uh, I mentioned that this does not inhibit the ability to belch, so the data showed that 99% of patients said, I have no trouble belching, I have no trouble vomiting. That's unlike a Nissen, because a Nissen patient, most of them, I, I'm really not aware of my Nissen patients vomiting with any regular ability. Um, the important thing to notice here, this is satisfaction levels with reflux control. These were patients on medicine, 66% were satisfied. Three years after the Lynx device, 94% were satisfied. I could, I could, uh, I'm pretty sure I could get any of my surgical patients, regardless of what we've done to them, to talk to you. And it is a, seems to be a uniform thing that patients do a lot better post-surgery than they do with medication. It's just because the surgery cannot control the regurgitation. If a patient has nothing but heartburn, medicine is going to be the thing for them. But after that, it really requires surgical treatment. Now, you may see our, in some of our materials the Heartburn and Swallowing Center uh, mentioned. And people say, well, what's a, you know, what's a Heartburn and Swallowing Center? Why do you have to do that? Well, over the years, what has happened in my practice is I've built up expertise in all the areas necessary for esophagus care. And I started out as a general surgeon in practice but I do a lot of gastroenterology related things as well. So I like to compare you know, my general surgeon self and my gastroenterology self with our heartburn and swallowing center concept of how we practice. This is the way I practice now. So in our practice, there's no referral necessary for patients to come in. I do all the endoscopy that I need for my patients. Some general surgeons in the community do not, but most you know, all gastroenterologists typically do. I don't operate on patients uh, just because they come to me with reflux. I insist that they all try medication because I want them to understand what medicine can do. That's the only way for them to really appreciate surgery if we ever do surgery on someone is for them to notice that medication doesn't exactly fix the problem. There is no surgical issue related to the esophagus that we don't manage. There is no issue related to Barrett's esophagus that we don't manage. We do all of our own testing. Uh, it's very unusual to find a general surgeon, the one who actually does the operation, who also understands how to read the testing that, that uh, leads up to the decision making. And no matter how complex the problem, I'd like to believe that we're able to handle those things without having to send a patient anywhere. Actually, to the contrary, what we typically see is that we have complex problems sent in to us to, to help figure out what's going on with them and see if we can't fix them. So that's why we, we think the Heartburn and Swallowing Center is a good idea. It's what I would call a disease-centric practice, meaning there's a disease here, all those things related to the esophagus that we are specializing in and offering expertise in. So in summary, patients who have mild reflux symptoms can usually be managed with weight loss, changing their lifestyles, their medications, the way they eat. There's going to be some loss of medication effectiveness over time, and medication is not you know, it's, it's not a miracle drug. It's certainly miraculous sometimes, but it's not going to fix everything. And uh, it's necessary to do a detailed evaluation if you really want to know how to treat someone. So, you know, you have to break some eggs to make an omelet. We have to do some testing to really understand what's going on with someone and make sure there are not any other problems. Laparoscopic fundoplication is an excellent uh, is an excellent solution for the majority of patients, with the exception perhaps of our obese patients. But there also are some newer procedures that have great promise for patients who are a little bit down on the scale. They don't have the same severe problems of a big hiatal hernia and Barrett's, for instance. I didn't mention this with the Lynx procedure, but those two things are actually exclusions from Lynx. So Lynx isn't for everyone, but there are a lot of people in this country millions of people in this country who are not getting surgical therapy who deserve to have it and we're trying to find those people, identify them, because I really believe that surgical therapy is, is 
is not being utilized where it should in certain patients. So again, I'd like to thank you for uh, attending the afternoon seminar. I'm going to take some questions, and I think... Uh